I'm excited to have Eric here today because Eric is someone who I, whose opinions I respect. And why I respect Eric is that he uh, really understands why he thinks about certain things in a specific way. How he looks at the world and, and, and he's able to articulate that. And um, so, welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks yeah, for being here. Thanks, CK. Yeah. So, um, here are some of the standard questions I always start off the show with. I ask the question, I'll ask you this question. What are some of the defining moments that you had growing up as a person and also as a man? Uh, defining moments. So, um, well, I kind of grew up um, in, so I wasn't from originally from this area. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, I grew up in a, uh, so I was, I, I grew up in Indiana, um, Northwest Indiana. So it's up near, kind of near Chicago area. Um, and, uh, came from a really hardworking family. So, um, early on, I, I think I kind of observed good work ethic, um, and, uh, you know, just people generally were, you know, working hard and you know do you know making a life for themselves that kind of thing and I always respected that um, and as I grew up you know as a kid uh, you, as a kid you don't really worry about those things like oh you know I've got to work or I've got to do these things but but for me it was more um, work was more something to enjoy and something to challenge yourself with and something to you know you know, to, to kind of uh, expand your horizons, learn new things. So, so actually, I have a qu question there. <clears throat> yeah. Interject real quick. So by a hardworking family, do you mean your parents had multiple jobs? Or they just long, work really long hours? Or what they had long, small businesses? Like, can you define that for us a little bit? Yeah, I mean, hard, hard working, I think, both physically hard. Like, uh, my, my dad is a carpenter, home builder, so... Um, it's a physically demanding job. Um, there's a lot of parts to that, you know, that are outside of a kind of a norm, normal job, I would say. Um, so just seeing, you know, seeing that, you know, that part, like working with your hands, working outdoors in different conditions and stuff like that was, it's different than an office job, going to an office and doing stuff like that. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's also, a, a lot of time you know you have to you know you wake up early you get an early start you you know so it's you, you just see it's it's hard to do those types of jobs without a good work ethic um, uh, and be successful at it so you, you have to have a good work ethic you have to be self-motivated and driven to do it every day that kind of thing so um, so yeah I think that was impactful for me to see um, but as where I was kind of going with that is as a kid, I don't think you necessarily, you, you, you see that, but you don't necessarily know what that means for you. You know, those aren't things you have to worry about as a young kid, like, you know, like work being something that supports you through life and gives you the opportunity to do the things you want to do. But I think at some point, um, as I got older, there were there were things that you know I wanted to be more independent I wanted to you know like be able to buy my own things or be able to to learn things for myself and that type of thing I had kind of I guess a very independent spirit so I started working at a very young age I had a paper out when I was uh, I think in middle school I was you know very young so I'm not even sure if I was even a teenager yet or maybe just into the teen years um, and I think that taught me a lot. I think that was one of the major first kind of transformative pivots in my life. Um, uh, it was a pa just a paper route, right? But for a kid, that's very demanding. You have to force yourself to be up early. You work seven days a week. You know, you the papers are delivered on the weekends and during the week. And where I grew up is um, there's a lot of extremes to the climate and summers are really hot winters are really cold so like delivering paper in the in the middle of winter is a very different experience than in the summer you know the cool mornings of the summer so um yeah it's just a lot of things when you dive into it that you don't factor in but um 
that I think I learned and uh, and I, I don't know if if good worth or good work ethic came from what I was observing or if it was more natural for me just just inherently natural I guess but it made me feel good like like working made me feel like I was learning something, accomplishing something, developing myself. And I mean, you, you make, you don't make much money delivering papers on a paper route, but for me at the time, that wasn't what I was going for. It was more the independence of it and the responsibility of it. And I think that was something that for me was very transformative. And after that point, I had always been working I, you know I worked in the summers with my dad or I worked um, other odd jobs through school and stuff like that so um, so just just going through that process and, and learning new things and and kind of expanding myself that way but um, yeah I mean that was something that was very impactful for me transformative for me um, so pause pause on that for a second so did your dad ever sit you down and kind of ask you questions about what did you learn today from paper route or anything like that it was just kind of naturally came to you I wanted to be more efficient I want to be more effective yeah I mean particular task. my parents were very supportive of it um, they would help me out with on the weekends and things like that when it, the routes were hard and you know or the weather was bad or whatever they they were very supportive but never um, they kind of let me do my own thing with it they were never you know not really directly using it as like a life learning experience or anything like that. I think they're more just like, you know, let's see where he goes with this. So, um, so that, so that part of it was more self-driven, I think. Um, and it was really one, a desire to be independent and two, I think maybe just stubbornness as a kid, like I'm doing this no matter what I want to do it, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, I'm sure they were, uh, you know, they were happy to see that I was willing to, to jump in and do that, but at the same time, they weren't kind of like, like quizzing me on it or forcing it or anything <laughs> like that. It was just a, let's, you know, let's see what he does. Let's see what happens. Kind All of right. Thing. So, so that's the first pivotal moment. What yeah. Are other ones? Yep. Other ones, I think, um, I mean, there's always, I don't know that I've always, I, I, I don't view a lot of things as major pivotal moments. I see a lot of like incremental things um, uh, that, you know, over time, just looking at things different ways, seeing the world different ways. But I, I think major pivotal moments are um, things like getting married, um, having kids, um, you know, yeah. things so like... So why don't we actually pause on that, get yeah. married, so what did you, why was it pivotal for you? Well. So going back to the first point, you know, the as a kid striving for independence and all these things, I, I think when you get married, you, um, you're now uh, committing yourself to another person and also committing to um, a life together and doing things together and, and all of that. So you're independent, but as a couple, I think. Um, so, um, so it's a major turning point in in the sense that um you know you 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 stop being as uh, before being married i think i was more uh inward focused kind of self-centered um you know things things good or bad was determined by how i felt like you know if i'm doing good in in at something or bad at something or if i'm happy in the moment or not happy in the moment uh, you know, it was just a very independent experience where um, having a significant other and, and getting married and, and those types of things are, um, you, you, you get a perspective from your loved one, from someone else uh, who's, who you're living with every day and you're spending all your time with and those types of things. And I think, you know, there, there's really great things about it you know there's struggles about it but that's all part of it you know it's the the good times bad times happy times sad times so like you um you i think uh um you know like with me and with my wife she's always pushes me to be better and you know and she's very um uh like patient with me and things that she wants me to change and you know and or that that I want to change about myself, and she'll be supportive of supportive of that and helpful. So it's like, 
you know, you go from being this independent spirit that I have to do everything alone to having something, someone else there to talk to and to be open with and to, you know, someone who you, you don't have to have any re reservations with, you know, and that's different. It's a very transformative thing, I think. So I want to dig a little bit deeper, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. Versus just going through the process, because yeah. you said a lot of interesting things, right? Because I'm, I'm newly married, <clears throat> and one of those th realizations that I had <clears throat> after being married is the typical notions of a perfect relationship yeah. is ones without any conflict. Yeah, but that's not reality, right? Yeah, the reality is you're two different human beings coming together, and more and more I realize a healthy conflict is actually a really good thing because then I have an opportunity for growth. I have an opportunity for a mutual agreement that may or may not uh, be able to arrive to if not for both of us being the same, you know, this this quote unquote conflict or make uh, the difference of opinion. Let's say, let's say. right. So, but. Was there a point that you, did you always look at it that way? Or you, was there a point where you kind of arrived to that, oh, okay, so this is what a healthy relationship looks like and that, that. Yeah, I mean, so, so all, I think all, everything you experience in life is really a learning experience, including, you know, getting, uh, going into a relationship with somebody at, at that level where, you are, you know, you are together all the time and you're, you know, you're, your girlfriend, boyfriend or married or whatever you're, if, if you're with someone, you're living with them, you're, you're experiencing life together, you're, you're doing all these things together, you're, you're going to have times that you disagree or times that you strongly disagree and, you know, and we're human, our, our, the environment around us changes our emotions and it changes our perspective on things and how we feel and, as two people, you're never going to be completely in sync on that. You know, some things might make you happy, and at the same time, you know, your your partner, your significant other, is not happy in that situation. And it could be little things, big things. That, um, so I think the the most important part is just good communication. Just, and that's something I've had to learn to do because I'm not inherently the best communicator. Um, in like relationships and things like that with you know with my wife she's always telling me just talk to me just talk to me you know um so so i i tend to process things internally a lot before i form my opinions or form a perspective on things and my wife's the opposite she likes to talk about things and you know kind of form the perspective together um so so i think you know i've learned to be more communicative and more understanding, like if there's something she's upset about, I shouldn't assume that, you know, if, if I don't think it's significant like she does, so I should, you know, be open with that and talk about it and try to find out, you know, what, you know, what makes this significant for her? Or if I'm, I feel something significant, how do I articulate that to, to, to help her understand why I think that thing is significant? And sometimes you change your opinion, you're like, Oh yeah, I was arguing about this and I'm wrong, you know, and then I think at that point ad admitting when when you're wrong and when you maybe we're going down the wrong path is a healthy thing to do and it's something that helps in all facets of life, but I think you learn that most in relationships because you find yourself doing it often, you know. Like, oh yeah, I got a little upset about that, but, you know, in hindsight it was not a big deal. I shouldn't have been that upset. I mean, one of the reasons I love talking to you because you just dropped some, at least for me, um, really profound gems, right? <clears throat> things like everything's a learning experience. Uh, things like, I can't remember what else you said, but you said something else really important. I was like, oh, wow. But but that's that's simple to say. It's You do realize that's not an ordinary mindset. But I, having that mindset makes you such a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, such an expansive person, right? You're able to, uh, adaptable person, you're able to adapt to whatever situation coming your way, uh, you're, you're able to learn new things from, you know, this conflicts that you have with your, your, with your, with your wife potentially, right? So um, I'm curious to know, like, how did you, like, get that learning mindset, because it is, in my, from my perspective, 
uh, the, the core of someone who is going to ultimately uh, live a successful, fulfilling life versus someone who is going to be victimized by life or circumstances. Where did you get that? Um, I mean, I think everybody has it inherently. I mean, everyone, we know, you know, if there's something we can't do or aren't able, you know, in a, in a heated situation or in a, you know, in a situation where, you know, you're pushed to do something, you, you adapt and you find ways to, you know, to make it work basically. Okay. And I, so I think everyone inherently has that that they, they are always learning whether they um, like kind of take a step back and look at that and realize that everything's a learning experience. So consciously or subconsciously? Yeah, in one way or another, gotcha. we're all doing it, whether we're conscious of it or not. And I think, so for me, in that way and in many other ways, um, I think the thing that, I don't know where I learned this or what point this shifted, <laughs> but I've always forced myself to be um, con basically force a consciousness so I want to you know something like everything's a learning experience I want to be conscious of that mm -hmm. so one of I guess the values I have is to is try to try to be conscious of things and try to look at things from the outside looking in but at myself you know like um, you know what's the positive in this thing in this experience or what's the you know, in a in a conflict, what can be learned? Like, what can I do better? What that that type of thing. So just staying staying conscious of the um, of situations, conscious of values, conscious of you know the. And I don't always do the best job at it, even though I want to. You know, I want to always be conscious, but sometimes I can, you know, get closed off for. Or be, human. Yeah. 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 So, so but I think at some point I always circle back to it and. Um, reflect a lot like you know what how did I handle that situation or what could I have done differently or what um, what could I have learned you know if, if we're going back to the you know always learning or everything's a learning experience so like like looking back on something and saying yeah that that was a great experience what did I learn or that was a horrible experience what did I learn you know and it doesn't always have to be lear learning from bad things. Sometimes you learn from good things too. Like something really positive happens, and and you're like, what what caused that? Why was that so positive? You know, what? You know, how can that be repeated? You know, so just staying conscious, I think, is is the is the thing that all of us have the ability to do, and it's just whether or not we realize it and we practice it. So. Beautiful, thank you. So I interrupted. <clears throat> you got married then? Oh yeah. Right, then the kids. Uh, kids, yeah. So that how was did they change you? that was another transformative thing. So and in a way it's kind of the same as getting married in the sense that like or or and I, and I'm saying getting married, but it could be any, you know, like any relationship where you're committing to a significant other. Um but um I think in that transition from being independent to sharing all your time and experiences and uh, with with someone else um, and then you have kids and before kids you and your partner are independent you're you know you you're adults you make your own decisions you live for yourselves that kind of thing um, in the same way that before having a significant other you're an individual and you're living for yourself so um, after kids, now there's this tiny human being that you are now responsible for, and you know there, there's so much that they're going to be learning and developing, and you know in the very beginning they can't even sustain life without you. So um, it's this very big responsibility shift, and I think you, at, I think in that experience you learn a lot about. Um, what really matters to you in life, like what things are important, what things you thought were important before don't seem as important now, um, and other things that you weren't even considering before become more important now. So, so it wasn't a defining moment, but it's also a progressive yeah, it's, learning experience. Yeah, it completely well. shifts your perspective on life and your approaches to things. You start thinking, I think you start I mean, some people naturally think very long term, but I think when you have kids, you you that goes to the next level. For, How long is very long term? Um, 
in I mean, I, I don't know the best way to quantify it, but I, I think you? before kids, I think you have you have a perspective on what the next couple of years or next few years look like, or maybe what your goals are, where you want to go in life. Um, after you have kids, it stops being so much about, you know, what am I doing or what are we doing or where do we want to go to what's best for our kids and what, you know, how can we help them in life? Because ultimately, I mean, as people, we, you know, you you spend time as a kid, you're growing up, you're learning, people are teaching you things, um, then you go off in life and you're independent and you're, you know, you're still learning, you're still doing your own thing, but then after you have kids now, now that kind of shifts where now there's someone, someone else uh, that you're passing the knowledge on to and you're teaching them the things that you learned and you're, um, you know, you're kind of developing them and in, in a lot of ways you're taking all the inputs that you had, like what were the, what were the things that I enjoyed most about my childhood or their times at their age and stuff like that and what were things I didn't like that I don't want to expose them to and stuff like that. So you start to make all the, um, I guess in a way you're using your own experiences to, to help form them or, or use that to form your opinions on how, you know, how you want your kids to grow up. And then you start looking at like, okay, later in life, like how am I, how am I setting them up for their own, you know, opportunities and learning experiences and successes and things like that. So it's just, you're, 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 you yourself and you as a, a couple with your significant other, you're, you're focusing a lot of more of your time and energy and everything on the benefit of your children and their futures and, and all of that. And you, I think you stop thinking so much about, you know, you know, what's right for us. And you're living more in the moment, I think, uh, as a couple and you're living more for the long term with kids, or at least that was my experience. So, now, so if a follow up question there. So is there a formal process or a ritual? Is there a, hey, let's sit down and look at the plans? Or is it literally like on the fly? You think about it, you may share, you may not with your partner about what you're thinking. Um, Walk me through, because it sounds like there was a lot of happening in your head, right? As yeah, there's, going through this. there's you know, nothing like, formal about having no. kids, no. No, 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 no. I, I don't <laughs> mean the having kids. No, yeah, or even right. raising the, and planning and yeah, all the that. It's, aspect of it. In the beginning, it's kind of chaotic. And for me, it's different because my kids are young so i have i haven't had you know i haven't had a lot of the how experience many and how, how? two 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 children um uh, my son is almost two and my daughter is four and a half so oh, beautiful. um and so yeah yeah <laughs> uh and um well maybe oh okay uh, we, right. well, so we'll that's see. that's right. that's part of the long-term planning like right, do right. do we want to bring another life into this world <laughs> so so in going back and forth in that decision and you know at times i'm feel very no and at times i feel like yeah maybe you know maybe we do we would want another kid and that's obviously a conversation where you as a as a couple with your significant other it's you know it's a big decision whether and you know some people you know, some people have kids, some people adopt, some people decide to not have kids. I mean, those are big decisions that you have to make together. Um, so in, th in that case, there is a lot of, you know, discussion and planning and, you know, sometimes not planning what, you, you know, you don't, you don't know. So, um, so but I think um, for me, like having young kids, I haven't been through all the processes of raising a kid. But I've been through the initial parts the right. you know they're 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 a baby and then they're growing up and then you're looking at like okay now we got to start thinking about school and stuff like that so um so there's a lot of decision points along the way that that is important to talk through and to think through and to you know what's what's best for a kid what would they enjoy versus you know what what things am I doing for 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 me or for us and from our perspective and what things are are going to be benef you know beneficial from their perspective what are they going to enjoy what are they going to be drawn to and you start to learn their personalities and see different things and you know you you that forms a lot of your decisions on and my wife and I were we don't really 
push anything on our kids like we don't push them to do specific things we kind of let them seek it out like with like um you know if you're doing like sports or if they're getting into you know arts or you know music or different things like what you know you see that early on like what they're into and um kind of let them we kind of let them you know form their opinions my my daughter's at an age where she can do that my son's you know he hasn't yeah, really so started really that process way. yet so yeah but but I'll, but just i guess to answer your question like the the planning and the decision making and all that it's it's very there's always new data points there's always new things that are coming in that are like oh yeah we didn't think about this and we talk through it or we you know or you know sometimes I'll I haven't thought through it all the way and I'll kind of defer to what my wife thinks is best or in some cases you know she does the same with me like I, you know and then sometimes you're going to be on the same page and sometimes you're not and I think when you're not on the same page then it's important to just like in any anything between two people it's just un, trying to understand the perspective of the other person and why why do they feel this way why why do we have this difference of opinion is there something you know is there information i don't have or is it just a strong opinion that you know that we differ on or whatever so and then just working it out like what you know how much does this mean to me to to win this point versus how much does it mean to them and sometimes it's like yeah i have this opinion but i'm it's not a strong opinion and the other person might have a strong opinion so just talking communicating same thing just going going through that process of of trying to come come up with a decision that makes sense for both of you and for in the in the situation of making decisions for your kids like sometimes what's what's right the right decision for your kid is and always you know the most ideal path or the the thing that you would necessarily gravitate toward yourself but but it's right for them so you're making the decision for them so do i don't you feel, i know that's vague but <laughs> yeah yeah do, do you feel like so some so some people say that now that they have this new responsibility as a new distinction right as a parent yeah and then that responsibility slash distinction uh, inspires them to be a better human beings or best examples etc etc i'm not trying to lead the witness but I, I wanted to ask you do you feel that way about changing your own behavior now that you have to be an example of someone else like that um yeah i mean you 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 mean like uh how you present yourself to your to your children right kind of um, what well, well, in front of or or even outside of yeah like, you know out of sight of your kids as an example yeah for sure i think um it's i i guess i never really thought of that before but it's it's hard to art- articulate it but i guess you uh with so around your kids there's obviously changes in behavior right you're you're an adult so you you know like swearing around your kids and stuff like that so you don't probably that. not a okay, good idea right. yeah. right. so so right. stuff like that i think you know those are obvious changes but there's also less obvious changes right like um you know i being more conscious of things i think is going back to the consciousness like the behaviors that that you for me i i don't want to tell my kids to do anything and then i wouldn't do that myself like kind of like telling them you do this or you should do this and and like i you know i'm in that way like maybe not practicing what i preach kind of thing so so i think you you always have that on your consciousness like in this in this thing that i'm about to do and i don't have any specific examples but you do think like oh they're watching they're going to learn from this so how i approach this situation is going to form how they approach this situation so you're conscious about that yeah like they're watching your every move exactly everything you say exactly okay. yeah and that's everything it's you know it's like uh you know conflicts with others that people you may not know or things like that or how you handle situations uh, it's everything that they see is at 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 the years like the age that my kids are they're like 
you know they're they're sponges at this point they're soaking in everything around them they're they're learning they're forming opinions they're forming personality they're learning how to deal with the world um and sometimes those decisions are a struggle like how, like how you handle a situation is it's gonna it's gonna show your your kid who you are uh, mm -hmm. who you and your significant other are as parents mm -hmm. it's gonna teach them how to deal with a specific situation you know at a, some point in the, their life they'll form their own opinion on whether that was right or wrong but you know in the moment in the short term they learn how to deal with that and it's it could be big things or it could be simple things to use a specific example it's um we we kind of struggle with our daughter is older, our son is younger. Um, she's uh, more calm in situations, uh, you know, like just like them playing or something like that. Where my son at times will get aggressive with my daughter. And now how we teach her to handle that mm. is a struggle. It's like, well, what do you do? Do you, you know, you tell her to hit back? Do you tell her <laughs> to talk through it? You're not, you know, you're not going to talk through it with a two year old. Two -year -old right. Right. So, um, so it's, it's a very complicated situation because there's, you know, it seems simple, like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, he's being aggressive, but then how you teach her to handle that mm. is pretty formative. It's, mm. it's, do you have an answer yet? It's a hard <laughs> question. I mean, he pushes it sometimes so far that it's like, you know, you, you don't want to teach her that you should you should just take it right? right and you don't want to teach her like oh if if he bites you punch him in the face you know like so so you have to try to find somewhere in between like what how do you handle that situation and as a parent those are hard situations because you know whatever you come up with is going to kind of form how they deal with conflict and how they deal with situations so and this is something my wife and I have talked about like how do we handle this what's the right way to approach this and it's not something anybody ever necessarily tells you hey you're gonna cross this bridge as a parent so you should form your opinion on this early it's not like that it's like he just bit her they're both crying how do we ha you know what do we do here how do we handle this um, so yeah so I think I, I would probably just laugh <laughs> first and foremost. Yeah, I mean, not not because I enjoy their pain. Sure, but but more of the oh man, this the is a situation, situation. Yeah, it's like a little overwhelming for me. Right, and my default reaction to it overwhelm is I I would just start to laugh. Yeah, and that, and as a parent, that to you it's not a big deal. It's a small situation, but from their perspective, it's it is a big deal oh, yeah like, that's the only thing they know yeah my my world is effectively ending I have this huge well of pain in my wrist or whatever yeah maybe. my brother bit me all right you know, and then my I'm, formative relationship my brother who i trusted <laughs> right like all that stuff now i'm looking to my parents because i don't i don't know how to handle this and situation they, they are not doing anything. They're, laughing. <laughs> they're laughing yeah right like, so man, that was a moment that could essentially trigger you know triggering effects then down the line that way exactly yeah yeah, so so it's and that's where I think like that's an example of a of a I think a little moment a small situation that has a very formative impact based on your decision your you know the way that you handle that so so that's where kind of falling back to kind of the consciousness thing like rather than being reactional or rash in that situation trying to be conscious of the fact that, you know, you're about to make a decision that has a bigger impact than you maybe necessarily know. So, um, and it, it's, a, it's also a difference of opinion, like for me and my wife, for, for you know, for me, it's like a, my natural reaction is to tell her, don't take that, like, you know, push back or yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but how far do you take that right, like right. back to the punch him in the face example that's <laughs> probably too far um so and then my wife's more like you know she she wants to help her understand why he's doing that which mm -hmm. is probably the better approach like why why you know why did he get so upset why you know and it's not you know and sometimes it's her pushing him too hard sometimes she did nothing wrong you know it's so it's 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 a complex situation to try to explain 
to a child of like, you know, what's, what's the cause and effect here and, you know, how do you handle it? You know, obviously if you're provoking it, that's one thing versus um, him just getting upset and it's an unprovoked thing. Like, you know, there's a different way to handle that. So, so just under, I think teaching understanding, but at the same time teaching that's not okay. Like you, you can't just do that, you, you know. So, it's very nuanced. Yeah. I get it. I appreciate yeah, it. I appreciate lot, it giving me a little bit of insight of the parenting moment. I, I wanted you. to use a specific example instead of being vague about everything. And that's, a, I think, a good example. Of no, it. it's that's a, a great example. It's a small situation with a lot of complexity to oh, it. Oh, for sure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, are there other defining moments that you can think of for you <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a person and as a man? Just... I think small things throughout life, just, um, you know, de decisions you make that you look back on and say, you know, I made the wrong decision and I'm not going to do that that way again versus things that, you know, you look back and you say, I didn't realize it then, but, you know, I took the right course or, or I did the right thing, excuse me. Um, so, so I, I mean, nothing, nothing, I guess, necessarily stands out in a big way as being completely formative or, or things like that. But I, I think it's just a more kind of the, the um, layering on of different experiences and different situations and always reflecting. I think reflecting is important where, you know, look, taking, a, taking time to, to think back of like, where was I at this point in my life? What was I doing? You know, how was I making decisions? what things you know at a certain point in my life I didn't necessarily have the whole like always be conscious um, mentality I think I was more internalized living in the moment not really thinking about past or future at all and then some at some point that I can't really define and that started to shift um, influences for me are big I think um, I like like uh, you know just random content not necessarily like big lengthy books or anything like that but just learning from the small things that people say or the things that people point out that are you know they're small statements but they're profound in their meaning and they have you know deep deep things that to use a recent example you know the uh another podcast you know the the joe rogan elon musk mm -hmm. dialogue that sure. was very popular in the news and everything for for other reasons but there were some takeaways from that that for me were impactful oh um, yeah like what let's, uh, let's talk about that for a second. I, I think one specific thing was uh hearing elon say kind of almost jokingly but you can tell it's something that um he thinks about in life is uh um uh, ha happiness equals reality minus expectations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so kind of implying that if there's no expectations, if you're just living in reality, then then you can be happy. And, and mm -hmm. when you start to add up expectations, you start to dim diminish happiness. So, mm -hmm. And I started thinking about that more and I was like, hmm, that makes a lot of sense. Where like, it, it, it's... You know, on its face, it's like kind of funny, and it's like, yeah, you know, okay. He simplifies kinda, things. Yeah, it's yeah. oversimplified, and mm -hmm. um, but when you really think about it, it's like, well, what what makes you not happy? And it's usually a failure to meet an expectation, where mm -hmm. you know something that some outcome or something that you thought would happen doesn't, or um, you know, or or something just doesn't meet your expectation of of what the situation should have been or what, what should have happened there. Um, those things diminish happiness. So, um, so then I guess to also use that as an example where, so I may be, I may be quoting this wrong or, or, or uh, I may be pulling the wrong book and author. I'm not sure, Sorry, but a, go for it. a while back, I, um, I remember listening to, I think it was an audio book, um, uh, called uh i think it was called 10 percent happier or yeah. something like dan that harris. dan harris yeah um uh and and he talks about you know a lot about a situation in his life that was very changing and formative and um uh in his big thing um if i'm remembering 
I don't know if I'm using the right words, or, but it was basically to have um, non-negotiables in your life, things that you wouldn't, you know, these are the things that I stay true to. These are the things that um, are non-negotiable, and they're typically things that either make you happy or, or improve your quality of life or, you know, make your situation for those around you, your sibling, sib or sorry, your, uh, yeah, it could be siblings, family, could be your wife, could be your kids, um, uh, just any, the people around you. It's, it's the things that, that make your quality of life better, make their quality of life better, make your time together better, make your, you know, things you want to, um, things you want to improve on, uh, things you want to, you know, just, just generally, um, things that you, if you compromise on in life will be bad for yourself or be bad for the people around you. Um, so, um, so that was something that kind of stood out to me. It was like, so what are you saying when you're non-negotiables? So I don't, I guess I don't necessarily formalize my non-negotiables to the level that he does. Okay. Um, and I, I have also heard through other, you know, listen, listening to other books or hearing other dialogue just uh, about things like, you know, there's a common theme, right? Non-negotiables, uh, setting principles in your life, setting sure. values in your yeah, life. Yeah, so yeah, sure. it's something that everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of these writers and authors and people who aren't necessarily authors that are just, you know, documenting their life and experiences tend to relate back to these things where I have to set these pillars in life that I stick to um, and these help me. Um, so, so I think things that I'm non-negotiable on are, um, and they're not necessarily well-defined or well-quantified, but, but always being conscious of, of making time for my family. You mm. know, sometimes you can get into the cycle of working so hard for, you know, you want to give a good life and a good future for your family to the point where you're not spending time with your family. And Correct. sometimes the things that matter most to yourself and to them are time together, you know, not sometimes, it's really pretty much all the time. So, so the more time you can spend together, like quality time where you're, you know, doing something together, learning something together, experiencing something together, those are important to me. And it's something that, you know, really my wife has taught me a lot to kind of be conscious of that, to, to think about that, because you can let life pass you by, mm. or you can experience it and live it. And, mm. you know, and I, you know, there's parts of my life that, that feel like compromises to that. Like I, you know, I, I have a long commute to and from work, right? right? And, um, but the, that's a, that's a negative, but the trade-off is, I feel like I really value the time when we're together and I'm also like spending time in that commute time doing things that improve myself through learning new things, you know, audiobooks and stuff like that. Um, um, but, but back to the kind of spending time together, I, I do it because of kind of the lifestyle that, that we can have together and the things we get to do and that type of thing. So it, for me, it's a, um, it's a, it's a trade-off. So Absolutely. I think my negotiables aren't as, as like written in stone as Dan Harris's are, but um, I think I have trade-offs in my negotiables, but it, they're, um, they're definitely things that I focus on. So, so spending time with family is a big one. Um, Self-improvement's a big one. Like I get very unhappy or, um, you know, I just don't feel good about myself if I'm not trying to improve in some way. Um, so that could be anything, could be how, how I'm eating, you know, uh, working out, something like that, um, learning, you know, new experiences, new, you know, just expanding, expanding my, you know, my own knowledge and and then also now teaching is more focus a focus for me and I think having kids was something that made that a focus for me so mm. teaching them things and letting them have experiences in life that mm. um, that's another thing that my my wife really pushes is exposing them to thing to things letting letting them experience life so mm. um, a lot of it for me is around I guess centered around family, so yeah. you, I guess you could put that in. So as family time, learning, and teaching. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Got it. And and yeah, and 
self-improvement and yeah i think that's kind of the big one how did you arrive to these non-negotiables by the way i mean we can go a lot of different directions but i'm also curious to know because there may be some process that you did or that kind of help you arrive to these non-negotiables yeah I, i think i'm not good about proactively forming them my no. my non-negotiables come from making sacrifices the or not sacrifices but making i guess you you'd call it mistakes mm-hmm. you know where there there were periods in my life where i was so extremely work focused that i was not you know not focusing on my family enough um and you know specifically like my wife and i at one point you know we were both working and had very different schedules and got you know it's easy to get caught up in that and not you know not be spending quality time together um so so i think making that mistake and realizing that that's not how i want to live you know live my life and just you know forming a non-negotiable around that like mm. okay we're going to make time for each other we're going to you know experience new things whether that's you know locally going somewhere that you haven't been before or expanding out and traveling somewhere and seeing something that you know experiencing stuff together so um so that's a big deal to me um the self improvement thing i think i think i've inherently always wanted to do that but at times you know i've just compromised on that and just you know i'm too busy to do this thing or i don't have enough time in my schedule to work out and if you really take a step back and look at that stuff and say like i'm you know i'm being a little bit ridiculous here like i can't find an hour in my day somewhere to work in a workout or i uh, you know Do they even need to be an hour yeah right or maybe 30 minutes or whatever it is right. just you know do something to anything you can do is better than nothing at all so mm-hmm. um and then something like uh you know like eating right so my my wife's very big on um foods and what we're eating and and what's in the food and stuff like that and that's something i ne- didn't necessarily always think about um but then as i started eating better and learning more about foods um and you know and just in general uh, you know about how you treat your body and things like that it pushed me to focus more on that and to make that more of a a center center of attention for me and i still don't always follow that the best you know there's times i'll splurge or i'll eat something really bad but um but i think I'm always conscious of that, you know, right. it's not it's a con- you know the consequences are coming. Exactly. <laughs> so it, it's a it's a it's an intentional <laughs> it's an intentional misstep, I would yeah, say, yeah. but um but it but it's something that I'm very focused on and very, you know, I I do stay very conscious of. So I think things like that, like just generally stuff that um if if I'm if I'm compromising my negotiable it it weighs on me so Got it. um so in that way i think they've been formed but they're not necessarily formalized one of the things i also kind of hear you say your non negotiables is that self reflection yeah it, it, that you may or may not be it's like fish doesn't see water so that's just something that you do right it's a discipline yeah so that's what that's what you think about all the time right yeah right discipline's a good term like i i think uh like discipline in in those types of things like self reflection and consciousness and all of that it is a discipline and it's something that i think some disciplines you have to force on yourself like and that's probably the more true to the definition of discipline where mm. i don't necessarily want to do this but i know it's the right thing to do and i need mm. to stick to it and i need to do it but i think other di- there's other disciplines that maybe there's a better word for it but they're more inherent it's like if i'm not doing this i feel bad or mm. um i feel guilty to myself you know it's some some a contract i've made with myself that i'm not necessarily living up to so i think for me self reflection fits more into that where mm. it's more of an inherent discipline it's not something i necessarily have to force myself to do um but it is something that i 
feel guilty about myself if I'm or to myself if I'm not doing it um, mm. if that makes sense it does actually so one of the my intentions of doing this podcast is to to have my guests share tactical things that they do so what are some of the disciplines that you do to keep you grounded as a human being to keep you grounded as a parent to keep you grounded as a as a, as a spouse uh, to really keep you grounded as a, as a professional, as a leader in you know, an organization. Uh, what Viktor Frankl, I want to share this quote with you and, and, and on the, so that it provides to the context of my question. Viktor Frankl, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he said, uh, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space lies our freedom and growth. So disciplines to me allows for lengthening that space, allows for options in that space, right? So, so what are some of the disciplines that you do every day, every week as a way to hone your own mastery, you know, these other areas in your life? Um, I guess that, that's kind of a hard question because I'm not, I do, I do change things a lot, I think, so I don't, um, there, there's nothing, I guess, that outside of self-reflection and self-consciousness, there's, there's nothing that, um, that I'm good about sticking to all the time, <laughs> like I must do this, I must wake up and do this, or I must have this ritual or this thing that I do. So um, I think I'm a little more abstract from that perspective, where um, uh, where I where I'll kind of venture out from my disciplines, I guess, and sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a bad way. Um, I think I think overall, um, just falling back to the self-reflection, just. Everything that I do, I tend tend to analyze, and I tend to think about the situation. And that doesn't always mean that I never make the same mistake twice. But mm -hmm. I think um, being very conscious of it and really thinking through something that that stood out to me um, is something that I do. And again, it's going back to the inherent discipline. It's something that's that's more inherent. But if I'm not doing that, it's it's almost like it's in my mental to-do list. Like I haven't thought about this thing through mm. yet. So it's there and it's, um, it's kind of waiting on me until I take the time to really think through it. So, so let's actually go through that a little bit deeper actually. Sure. I know that I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but a lot of people use that word or that phrase a lot. I'm thinking it through or, you know, as a piece of advice to someone, let's think it through, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So what is thinking it through? Like, when do you stop? Because you can overthink things. Sure. And actually never do anything. Yeah. Right? So, getting it, and you'd actually do it very well, where almost anything that I talk to you about, you have an answer, you have a mental model, you thought about it, and you're able, so that's one. Two, you're able to articulate your inner workings, which, again, a very impressive thing. And, and, and three, you take action on those things. You're one of the highest performers at our organization and, and, and people respect you as a leader as a result of all these efforts that you put in to think it through. So can you unpack that for us? Like what is, Yeah. how do you, if, all right, let me ask you a phrase in a different way. <clears throat> if I'm listening to you right now, brand new person, I don't think about things through my life. I want to learn, like, give me some tactical things I can do to think things through. Yeah, so, I mean, I think everyone has, you know, everyone has kind of the, the two, you almost have, like, two threads of dialogue in your mind, right? You can reason with yourself, you can... It's almost like two people talking inside your head, right? I don't know the best way to explain that, or maybe there's an actual, like, scientific reason for that. Or, um, but but you really you you can have a conversation with yourself, and there's you know there's you reason through things, you you kind of think through, and you think through a situation. What you're really doing is 
analyzing things, whether it's pro, pros and cons or outcomes, like if I, you know, cause and effect type stuff, well, if I take this approach, then I think this will happen. And if I take this approach, I think this will happen. Um, so I think it really depends on what you're thinking through, like what the actual approach is, but the process is the same. It's an internal dialogue. It's um, having so a conversation it, so with you yourself. So you use internal dialogue as a, as, a, as a mental model? Yes, for me. And for some people want to, I think, more inherently want to externalize and they want to talk it through with someone else. Um, but for me, I have a hard time doing that um, because even when I'm talking something through with someone else, I'm still analyzing and having that before, internal dialogue. Right, before yeah. you even externalize whatever is happening. Exactly. I yeah. So I, so I don't know if, if I'm just weird in that way or if it's a, you know, it's weird a, a trait, you know, kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's very much taking that, taking that internal dialogue, forming the expected outcomes or forming the opinions or, or that type of thing. Um, but what I, something that I, in more recent in life, I've been trying to force myself to do better is um, in the past, a lot of times, that's where that would end. I would mm -hmm. form my own opinion or perspective internally, and then that was it. That, that was, was it. the decision. It's in stone. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, high five, virtual high five yeah, in your head. high five myself. Yeah. Um, uh, but what I've been trying to force myself to do, and then again, this is going back to self-awareness, self-consciousness, is, okay, that's a bad place to stop that decision-making process. Because, um, you know, even though, you know, the two parts of yourself have worked this out, you haven't validated this in any way. And I'm kind of equating it back to science, right? Like a study or a thing, uh, you know, uh, an observation or... Um, it's done once and it's done in a lab and it's done in a controlled way and there's an outcome, but it doesn't end there. There has to be verification. There has to be follow -ups. peer review. Yeah, peer review and tests and studies and follow-ups. So in a way, I'm kind of doing, forcing myself to do that same approach where, okay, I've formed this perspective. I've formed this opinion. So is there someone I can externalize this with okay. to get some verification here? Did my did the two did the did the two me's up in my head come out with the right outcome, or was that, you know, was that literally a decision made in a echo chamber or in a bubble? Um, so so I think validating um, is important. Um, externalizing your thoughts that make sense to externalize, you know, things that that someone else a conversation with someone else can validate your decisions or thought process or you know, and that's something I think where communication with the significant other is important because a lot of those kind of internal dialogues that are more personal you, you that person you can be very open with and have that conversation like hey I thought this through and this is what I came up with what do you you know what, what do you think and getting an opinion outside of yourself is important um, and it also helps communication too because a lot of times the things you're thinking through are decisions that are impacting other people around mm. you um, and if you're not validating the effects of those decisions maybe directly with the people that they impact or more broadly with people who can just help you form those opinions um, is important because it's you know you, what you've come up with is going to impact others so that's something I don't necessarily do well or that I haven't done well in the past and it's something I'm very conscious uh, of improving and I in pretty much every situation where I do do that and that's something that I think I guess this could be a discipline or ritual that I forced myself to do but never really formalized it in that way it's just something that I do but um, when I do that and when I when I do that effectively I, I the outcome is almost always much better than the um, perspective or opinion I formalized mm. or I internalized. Um, so one of the things I, because you talked about the word influence, and I believe hugely that uh, our environment, right, the people that we surround ourselves with, uh, the people that we seek counsel from, the people that we use to validate our opinions and, uh, are hugely influential to. <coughs> 
the outcome of our lives, right? So you mentioned that you seek validation or you validate your opinions with your spouse. Beautiful, awesome. I try to, yeah. yeah that's yeah, I want to get better at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. So, who gets you? What are some of the criteria that you use to、uh, for the counsel that you keep in your life? Is it domain expertise? Is it proximity? Is it duration of friendship? Is it inherent trust? Is it I'm, I'm just listing a number of things. Like so,、uh, is it I, random? And like, how do you? Can you rephrase that? I guess I don't understand、sure. the. How do you select the people? How do you select the company you keep? How do you select、uh, the counselors you keep? Okay.、Um, I mean. That's a good question. I guess I've never really thought about that. It's,、um, I, 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 so there's there's different levels of that. I guess. I、sure. guess there's you know, there's people you really trust and who've who've helped you make decisions or think through things or you know just generally have provided good guidance、um, that. I think in, in situations where you're you're trying to think through something, you're trying to get an outside perspective. You go to those people first. Those are the first people you think of. You people know. that are giving you good advice in the past. Good, ad- yeah. Whether it's you know whether it's good advice or generally have good perspectives on things, or if it's something specific you're thinking about, maybe thinking of a friend who's an expert in that way.、Um, but.、Um, But I think just generally, the people that I'm most drawn to are、um, n- people who challenge m- me to be a better version of myself, and also expect that of the their friends and the people around them. Like、mm. they want to be around you know people who challenge them and make them better versions of themselves.、Um, I think that's something I'm drawn to.、Um, I'm drawn to, you know, just generally, you know, good-spirited people, hardworking people.、Um, I don't, I don't have like one category. I guess that's like I, I, I actually think it's the opposite of that. I, I like, I like surrounding myself with a kind of a broad spectrum of people. Diversity. Yeah, different disciplines, different backgrounds, different everything because. In a selfish way, it's probably just another version of me trying to be better and make better, you know, make a better,、uh, formulate a better self, and always be challenging and proving myself.、Mm-hmm. Um, if you have a good diversity of friends around you, I feel like that's easier to facilitate. You know,、mm-hmm. there's a good circle of people. But I, I'm also a person that.、Um, Like close friends, like people who I really、um, trust and go to, and things like that. That's a very small group.、Right. Um, so I have, I think I have a, a broad group of general friends, but、yeah. uh, a larger group of general friends. But I have a, a small group of people that I I would call my、um, okay, like so, kind of direct. Yeah, no. So let's actually go a little bit deeper in that、yeah. specific thing, right? Close friends. Yep. Some may call it.、Uh, Circle of men or council. I mean, whatever you call it, just close friends, right? How did you pick those people? What are some of the common denominators? What are some of the criteria that you use, consciously or subconsciously?、Um, And why you think about that? Let me kind of、uh, contextualize the question a little bit. Yeah,、sure. there's a, a famous phrase in the personal development world that is.、Um, Uh, we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with, right? And and you know, on the first hand, when I hear about it, oh yeah, like, that's a very oversimplified statement. But the more I think about it, if you look at、uh, the outlook of someone's uh, uh, positivity, motivation, work ethic, or even net worth, is actually quite.、Uh, it's not deterministic, but it's pretty pretty damn on point. Yeah. So. So, so therefore, I'm very conscientious about who are the five people that I spend, you know, my most、uh, t- time with. So, coming back to this, how do you select the the the, the people that you're closest with? 
I guess I've never really thought of it. It's just kind of happened naturally. But okay. if I try to dissect it, so doing the, you know, take a step back exercise and yeah, look yeah. in to see to see what, you know, what has made me make that decision on, about people. Um, the thing that I think of, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is it's, it's people who, who I've had life experiences with and I generally like the way that they, or I'm drawn to the way that they've approached those experiences or handled those experiences. Um, just generally how, how I guess they go about life and probably naturally drawn to people who are in the same way, very self-conscious, self-reflective. Um, uh, so for me, I think, it's really, it's actually something really hard to answer because I, I don't, I don't necessarily I don't know. Questions. It's only hard questions. <laughs> I don't necessarily know. I, I guess it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I just think of the same thing. It's everyone in that group of close friends, I would say, are people that I've had, you know, life experiences with. Things that were, whether, you know, whether it was usually not like one-off experiences, usually like, you know, spent a lot of time with that person and over time the friendship has developed and um have just learned things about them that i value and and that type of thing so um so i i think that's important to me like uh um ha being around people who aren't you know aren't judgmental and you can have a a good conversation with and they can you know listen and f and be able to um help you do the validation step and go through thought process with you and things like that. Um, tip, typically people who are, um, I guess, think a little deeper or think about things in a, in a um, more externalized view is, is something I value and I enjoy you know having conversations with people who who have who do that um mm -hmm. so um but I, yeah i can't i can't pinpoint anything that's like yes this is what <laughs> if, <laughs> here's the five things if on you're my gonna checklist. be in that tight circle you have to go through this process what like, was that's that uh, uh, robert in your movie with uh, ben stiller uh, you're in my circle of trust. Yeah, right, right. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have a checklist or a, a specific gate you have to go through to get in the <laughs> circle of trust. It's just it's experience. It's experiencing life together and um, you know, yeah, being able to reflect. Yeah, one of the things I'm actually really <clears throat> fascinated about is how can we create such a life experience together. Um, obviously, we can't force anything. Yeah. Right. Let's say you and I, we, I can't like force you to be my best friend or, or be in your circle, inner circle of trust as an, as, as an example. However, we can create events that could increase the probabili probability of that happening by yeah. putting us in situations of, let's say, um, peak experiences. You know, things like a Burning Man as an example. Right. Yeah, sure. Right. Things like that. <clears throat> so, um, hence why I'm interested in in exploring always for me personally um, what are some of the other events in the world or even in my life or in each other in each other's lives that we can create such big experiences so that's something that I'm um, quite intrigued about and I'm exploring right now personally um, wilderness training as an example okay right, right, right. yeah that's and that's definitely if you go through something like that with someone else um you learn a lot about each other you learn you know deep things like how does someone conduct themselves in a stressful situation and right. all of that so yeah i think those are the types of things that i think help help me form stronger bonds with others is you know just going through those types of life experiences but part of it is also what you do after that you know you can have a great experience with someone in life and then if you never speak to each other outside of that time you know mm -hmm. that over time that bond fades you know mm -hmm. they go on with life you go on with life and they're you know doing their own thing changing who they are you're changing who you are and you kind of at some point diverge and it doesn't mean that it that that 
bond can't be reformed and there's always you know there's always a piece of it there mm -hmm. to to kind of you know the high school reunions right? yeah, or yeah anything yeah just mm -hmm. you know just conversations like keeping in touch with people that you're close to and things like that or you know so personally i'm really bad at that <clears throat> me too, so me are, too. There, <laughs> are there things that you do to nurture such uh, relationships um, especially i mean at least for me too i'm very conscientious about uh, formulating a strong masculine male relationships i think for me as a man that's really really important uh, and therefore, I want to be more conscientious about how to do that. And I'm actually pretty terrible at it, so I'm curious. To know your I'm bad at it too, so I can't <laughs> provide any good advice. But um, uh, yeah, I think for me, I, I'm um, I, my ex, my bonding time and those those follow up experiences and stuff like that. They come from presence, from being present with each other being together um i'm not like a big phone talker and you know that's for me it's hard in a phone conversation it's you know it's a conversation and you you know you're you're having that dialogue and and back and forth but it, it's not the same as doing something with someone right going through a wilderness training or something like that so so for me i think it's more important to have those experiences but I think for others, um, maintaining a bond or maintaining that relationship is uh, as simple as a conversation and just being, you know, being in communication with that person and catching up with each other on occasion and learning what's going on in each other's lives. And um, I've learned over time to value that more, um, mm -hmm. to and try to be more conscious of that and try to do it. But at the same time. Um, it's it's not something that I've formed as a well-developed discipline and it's something I want to improve you know I want to catch up with people mm -hmm. more frequently and talk to family and friends that I you know I get caught up in life and I don't make a simple phone call that can you know that has a lot of impact because you know just that conversation and that catch-up is meaningful so you know I, I want to explore an idea with you and this is not well thought of at all so it's speaking of you know well thought out um, I believe that men in general like to do things yeah take some action doing something so talking on the phone uh, may or may not be it's not my cup of tea right I mean I, we're doing this right now as, as a conversation but um, but generally speaking I like to do some something right whether it be going having an experience or doing a project or or ideally something physical right <clears throat> so more and more I'm thinking about is there a service project is there like a um, something that I could do as a way to like something physical like a habitat for humanity as an example right so I can invite all of my guy friends or wherever that I want to maintain relationship with and then so we do we go there to do some physical hard stuff and there is something physical we can look at that hey we did that thing yeah. whatever and it has a broader um, uh, significance so it's not just a barbecue barbecue comes and goes right? yeah it's a meal it comes and come go through your system that, that's it i don't right. actually see anything but um something like a habitat for humanity or or some something like a tiny house building or something that we built with our hands and then then we can give it away or sell it or whatever and then give it the proceeds to some people outside of us that can benefit sure there's a benefit to others yeah right? so something i'm thinking about what do you think of it well, I mean, I think that definitely satisfies a kind of a for for us being human, it's it's more of a a primal thing that I think just. Is it, so you think it's a human thing? It's yeah, not a yeah, I think humans, uh, us in general, have no. changed the way we live so much in such a short period of time, and I, I mean, like you know, the past few hundred or couple thousand years, I think there is still inherent things in our being in our DNA or whatever our instincts that are um, 
more primal that are more uh you you see it in kids right like in a new baby they come out very primal they're just reactionary they're instinctual they're you know as they grow and start walking and start doing things it's like i joke that my son's like a little caveman you know it's um but it but there's some truth to that there's some things that are just wired in us that are natural and i think you know being around others and accomplishing things together in a in kind of a group effort type thing is very inherent and natural to us and it is what forms kind of bonds and forms that um uh kind of like a almost like a tribe or pack mentality kind of thing where you know the reason we got to where we are now is because those types of small close knit community driven things and over time we've turned it into like monetary systems and all these things and we keep trying we keep trying to find ways to be more independent you know circling all the way back to the beginning of the discussion with you know my desire for independence and that's why I started working and all that stuff um i there's there's part of us that wants that independence but at the same time there's a big part of us that is like we can't do this alone you know um and then that goes circles back toward the more later part of our conversation where you know trying to be more inclusive of others in my own thought process and validate decisions and things like that is more you know more group think or more community driven so i think something to you know like habitat for humanity or something like that where where there's a a, a group effort a community effort and um i think that's a strong bonding experience and then at the same time if you're doing a program like that there's a big benefit to to others so there's even more of a community aspect to it you know it's at one point in our lives that's how we operated you know everybody would get together and do this thing that was right for the group um so um so i i think yeah i, I mean i think that can be definitely a, a strong experience i i also think that the thing that forms bonds and lasting bonds is having repeatable things you know if so like habitat for humanity being a one time event is going to be impactful and you'll form some bonds out of that but if there's no follow up to that there's no ritual yeah it diminishes yeah. over time so if it's like you know you you as a group decide that you're going to do that on a yearly basis you know like every year we're going to join one of these projects and do it together or if you have like I was thinking weekly or weekly <laughs> okay or weekly or yeah something. what a, it, yeah i think whatever just whatever may be just yeah. just turning it into a ritual something you do together that you get together and that's what you do um i think that's a definitely a formative thing and I, i think other things like even just simple things like you know be joining some type of team or group or you know some kind of regular thing that you get together and do and even if it's simple like a um I enjoy diving right and I don't get to do that often dive. yeah I don't get to do it often it's not something that I make time for often but when you when you do that with people you you definitely feel um closer to people because it's you in those types of things and those types of of experiences you have to really rely on each other and you're trusting the person that you're with to you know to be looking out for you in the same way that you're looking out for them and you're you keep you know the 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 safety of the group depends on awareness of each other and i think those things just naturally are kind of bond forming so yeah and it's like i said it that's not something that's a really i would ca- call a ritual but when i do it i feel those things i know you know i know that's there so mm, beautiful are there um other tools recommendations disciplines books uh, podcasts that you recommend for any any of my my one men specifically but any of the audience listening to this to be to really kind of help them think about ways to define themselves as a man in, in modern times I mean it's really about personal goals what you want to learn what you want to be better at you know what you already know versus what new information you want some people do well with um you know like very science driven books and some want more you know 
things that are maybe more spiritual or religious or whatever. So I think it's, it's more about finding your passion and what you want to improve, what you want to change, what you want to do better or learn about. Um, and then finding the, the authors or the books or the podcast or whatever that fit that thing. Um, like, you know, if, um, well, things they're like, listening to this podcast right now wanted to be better men in modern times. So that's what their interest is, right? So I'm asking for a specific, like, well, I think some of the things yeah, that I think the interest could be there. I want to be a better man. I want to be a better person. Um, but how you get there is everybody's own avenue, right? Sure. Like for me, being a better person might be understanding things, um, understanding how to self-reflect or mm. understanding human psychology or something. Like I, I guess to use a specific author, I really like um, a lot of like the Malcolm Gladwell work. Um, I think it's a little more psychological at a level um there's kind of it's almost case study-ish if you will and um going through some of that stuff but um but some people might be more drawn to like a you know a more spiritual approach and they want to be more um abstract in the thinking or stuff like that so it's just what's you know everybody has the same path I, you know in in this topic i want to be better i want to push myself to be better but I think everybody has their own unique path to get there. So I think if you don't know that path, then you know that you want to get to the end, but you don't know what path you want to take or you want to work. I guess there is no end. You're always going to be, you're always going to be, you know, going through a continuous improvement process, a constant learning, but, but defining your path, I think is the important first step. Like what is the thing, what is the thing that compels me to get there? What is the thing that's most natural? for me you know how what approaches make the most sense like what what because if it's something you're not into you're gonna fall out of it you're not oh, gonna okay do so it. let me ask you a, given that you're a technologist right yeah and 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 this could take us down a rabbit hole you're a technologist <laughs> you have young children yes and what's up and coming you know artificial intelligence all these yep. you know beautiful technology exponential technologies yep right <clears throat> So in thinking ahead, like a way to guide your children as an example, how do you help them guide what paths to take them to the future that they want to live into, given that the future is so uncertain? Sure. Right? Given the tools that we're creating could lead us to various paths yeah. that is, we don't know. So yeah. how do you guide them in choosing that future? Well. For the foreseeable future, um, the one thing that will remain constant is is how open-minded we are and how um, what approaches we take um, in our thought processes, whether that's augmented or whether that's purely biological. Um, you know, just and in, in getting like not to go too deep down the sci down the technology rabbit hole, but but we're already doing those things. We're already using phones to form opinions or computers or the internet in general. Um, that's kind of like a collective of human thought and we use the opinions and publish uh, things other people have published to form our own opinions. But you have to be good at being open-minded and how to accept all the noise, take, all, take in all the inputs. Um, and then wait, wait, back up. What did you say? Accept all the inputs and take in all the noise. Taking all the noise. Take in all the noise. All the you go on social media, it's noise. You go right. on news, it's noise. You right, go right. on the internet in general, it's noise. All right. Um, conversations with others are driven by the thoughts they're formulating off of the things they're seeing in all of these Some forms of yeah, yeah mm -hmm. forms of communication. They're really forms of communication where. As humans, we constantly get better at communication from, you know, way back when it was like not even really verbal communication to now when we're using, you know, internet and, you know, radio and all these different ways to communicate with each other. Um, so, uh, so I think being able to be good at taking in all those inputs, all that noise and funneling it down to um, um, 
effective and actionable things that make the most sense to yourself and benefit others, you know, make yourself better, make others better. Um, just being able to process information in general, because right now there's no shortage of information and mm -hmm. that's not slowing down. That's mm -hmm. only going to change. We're going to get faster with information right mm -hmm. now. We're, um, uh, I, I, not to be going back to quoting Musk, but I think he, he at some point I, remember hearing something about bottlenecks in human communication That's and right. how bandwidth. Our, yeah, bandwidth. Yeah. yeah right. So our right he, he expresses that our thumbs are our bottleneck, right? Mm. That was pretty profound to me to hear that. And it took a lot of mental internal dialogue to process that and say you know, that's completely true. Or the rate at which we can create information right now is driven by how fast we can type or how fast we can, you know, um yeah, uh, to articulate our thoughts via our thumbs. <laughs> so, so, how, so the next level to that, the natural progression is make that process faster because that's what we seem to continue to do is to improve technology and make things faster and more accessible and more closer to the, you know, in computing specifically, you start out with big central system that does processing and then it goes on to connected systems that can process together and then it goes on to a whole net and internet of systems that can now all communicate with each other and it keeps getting broader and our interface to that keeps getting better it went from you know like cards in a machine to a screen to you know now terminals to now standalone units to now the whole things in our pocket so what's next you know is there um, augmentation of ourselves? Is there a convergence of technology and biology that you know that happens at some point in the but future? It's an innovate issue sounds like like he's similar. He's somewhere similar down to computer human interface. Exactly. Right? Like so, closer and closer, closer, closer. Yeah. So so that that stood out to me, and and you think about that, and you think about you know what what is our as a human, what is our own capacity to digest information? Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about it, we're actually really good at it. We're to taking information to, to 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 knowing how to get it mm -hmm. and to take it in, and then to formulate whatever we're trying to formulate from it. Right? Mm -hmm. Something simple, food. You know, you're you're into um, you know understanding the food, the fuel that you're putting in your body. Mm -hmm. You obviously do a lot of research on that. Mm -hmm. um, you want to learn to make something new. Mm -hmm. You go out and you find a recipe online or a method online to make that thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or on, you know, via your phone or via an app or via whatever the method is. You're using, you're using the content that other people have created. Mm -hmm. You know where to find it. You know how to get it. You know what to do with it when it comes in. Um, it's very accessible now more than ever. Um, but what 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 happens next? Like when that becomes more and more accessible, how how do you continue to be good at processing that information and knowing what to look for, and knowing you know what you want or what you want to change? And I don't see that changing a whole lot over time. I, I don't see I see the process being the same, and I think the technology and the innovation will be designed around. Uh, like it always has been, what benefits the human. And I know there's conversations of AI and what happens when it goes to the next level. And it's, you know, it's, but I, AI is really just a creation of our own thinking, our own minds. So AI is only ever going to be what we can make it be, right? You think so? Even a computer is really kind of an extension of how we work. It has a memory, it has a way to store data. Sure. It has, and so, so we create we create things that are similar to us and similar to our thought processes and right. think like us and do like us. Right. So if we really even get to the point of creating an AI, right. how non-human would that thing actually be, you know? Well, I mean, that, but, that, but, that, but that's... Um some people may say the scary thing, right? Because then you're, in my mind, the word I use is uh, it magnifies human desires. Yeah. Right? But human desires are so complex. 
Yeah, but it's right. intrinsically within us, there's a desire to to do good things, great things, amazing things, to create, to build, to 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 communicate, right, to collaborate, and all all this beautiful higher level thinking. But there is also, in my mind, the primal aspect of it. Sure. To uh, to kill, to hunt, to to hurt, to injure, to whatever. Right. Maybe when my ego is is being um, bruised or or. or or, or feels the danger or whatever it may yeah. be. So all of those you know, complex desires could be multiplied infinitum. Yeah, <laughs> by these things. sure. Might not to pontificate or philosophize too much, but hence the interesting dichotomy we have, especially as uh, stewards of interesting resources as parents or as uh, entrepreneurs, uh, as technologists. And when we create these things, how do we how do we how do we uh, govern? <laughs> yeah. How do we guide? How do we help future generations to to do the right thing? Well, fortunate for my, for us, we've never found a way to make vast changes happen overnight. Um, it it happens over time and it changes slowly. And maybe that tips with AI. Maybe we get to a point where yeah, it is happening overnight. We can't control it. But but. It, I, I see the progression of technology kind of maintaining with, if you go back 200 years and you explain what we have today, mm. that would be really scary to a lot of people. Correct. <laughs> and they would probably say that that would end humanity and mm. you know, that, that it would be so catastrophic to have that, you know, that level of access and resources and all these things. Um, and, you know, just explaining all the things that we've done over the past 200 years would be almost difficult to mm -hmm. articulate. Good point. Um, so, so assuming the future from that and moving forward from that, to answer your question of, you know, how do you, you know, how do you handle that? How do you teach how to handle that? I think it goes back to just keeping an open mind and understanding that we are humans and we're developing it. So we get to make it whatever we want it to be. Um, you know, obviously we're not doing it individually. There's, it's a big thing. It's a community thing, all, you know, but we're just one group. We're a bunch of people on one planet, you know, trying to figure this stuff out and trying to build it. So we have the opportunity to make it what we want. And I think there's always, the thing that has got us this far and the reason we even e still exist now is there's always been methods, whether they're crude and brutal or whether they're more um, closer to current times and a little bit more diplomatic. I think there's always been ways to govern things and to make sure that we're not destroying ourselves. And there's definitely trip ups in that and time, times in history where we haven't been good at that. But for the most part, we've found ways and we've learned how to adapt to technology and how to use it for good and it gets used for bad too but um, but so far we haven't we haven't killed ourselves off with it so maybe maybe that changes like the past shouldn't be a indicator of the future but um, but I, I have faith that over time as these things evolve and we get better at these interfaces and we information's flowing faster and information's making more decisions for itself. I, I think I have faith in in us that we can use that in the right way and we can, you know, really uh, you know, and not to again not to get too techy or too down the rabbit hole, but but I, I think we're gonna um, go the route of augmentation way before we go way before we ever figure out artificial intelligence mm. um, so I think that the convergence of technology and biology will happen at such a fast rate that mm. there is no clear line between human mm. intelligence and mm. artificial intelligence mm. 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 so at that point does it really matter if mm. you know good point mm. Yeah, one of the reasons I'm really, so I'm, I'm kind of bipolar about this, right? I'm a huge believer, I'm a technologist at heart, I, 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 I am a, <clears throat> an optimist <clears throat> around technology. So I, I'm definitely on your boat there. I'm a, but I'm also of the opinion that um, until we understand ourselves, 
internally knows actually what's happening inside the inner workings right why do we think about certain things what what are our non-negotiables what are the values what are our principles what, what's what's really governing my thoughts um, technology may be able to help us multiply or accelerate the things that we want to do but once a lot of times once we got the things that we want we thought we want and we realize like oh there's no satisfaction the whatever peak experience I got from this thing is it's not enough let me go chase some other bigger thing yeah and then it realized oh yeah more and more just tunnel with no cheese it's going back to the primal thing right it's never going to be enough there's never going to be enough and ultimately I I love the way Buddhism the uh, the Buddha kind of talked about like um all suffering stems from attachment. So ultimately, it's not the external things that's going to make one happy. Ultimately, is that growth. Ultimately, is that that, that that peace of mind, awareness. Anyways, not to again. There's a whole other rabbit hole. I don't want to get down to with the with, with this particular time. But I think it's so important that we get that understand what's happening between our ears, uh, understand our own psychology, understand what makes us tick uh, in a way that's when I lead us to that deeper fulfillment, <clears throat> then we can use the tools that we have to help us, you know, maintain that, to cultivate that, to and to to make the kind of to life that we wanted to live. That's, yeah, that's my mental model. Yeah, no, and I totally agree with that. And I think things happen incrementally, but not always on the same pace. So at some points technology gets too far ahead and that's and at some points our own progression catches up or passes up and then technology catches back up and the the pursuit for never enough kind of thing is what drives everything development of technology you know how we go about life the things we eat the things we do the you know we have construction across the street that may be creating noise for this you know this audio here but you know like that's forward progress it's building it's you know it's it's humans doing what humans do so um i i think um i think over time i i think that as long as we keep all of that in check the way that we do now and just keep doing that we're like not letting the technology get so far ahead that that society and people and haven't caught up to it um Mm -hmm. It's too overwhelming. It's too much too soon, um, and we see that happen. And we see technologies go away because of it, or ha- come on, really, you know, deal with really hard struggles and troubles because they're it's too much too soon. Um, self-driving cars, great example. Like we could have every car on the road tomorrow be self-driving, but there's other reasons why that doesn't happen. There's you know, there's a monetary system. Not everyone can just go buy a self-driving car. There's legal systems that govern, you know, can we allow this? Can we have cars cruising down the highway by themselves that aren't ready for that? That, you know, we'd probably have, if, if, if tomorrow we took all the cars off the road, issued everyone a self-driving car, we'd probably, as much as people who develop self-driving cars would tell you that it would be a, a utopian world, we'd probably have a surge in accidents, deaths, bad things happening because the technology is not refined. But if you do it slowly, if you introduce it and get better at it and yeah, there's going to be some bad missteps, some, you know, some things that happen that weren't accounted for. Um, There was a big thing in the news about a self-driving car hitting a pedestrian crossing a street, you know, and the car didn't see it and the driver wasn't paying attention. It's Um, it's the technology has to grow it has to get better and it's not just that application it's in everything Um, and if we do that at the right pace um, and with the right oversight and the right mentality ultimately we get to a really good place I think in 20 years yeah you could we could be in a situation where at least the majority of the cars on the road are all electric and self-driving but it didn't happen in a week or a day or a year it happens over time so I think for our own sake even though we have the ability to throw technology so far ahead of where we are we we approach it in a rational way and we do it in a controlled way and I mean I'm confident that 
people will always grow with technology and will will always um, will always blur those lines between like I said before what's artificial and what's biological or human and at some point it will just converge and there will be no difference and then you know it's just the natural progression so mm. I think this is a good place to end it. Hey, Eric, All right. thank you so much. I <laughs> yeah. really, really appreciate your time. So I want to acknowledge you first. I want to acknowledge you for just being so open to go the wide variety of topics that we cover. Yeah, right? From the very, very personal to the very, very kind of macro humanity-based yeah. type conversation as a technologist. I want to acknowledge you for just being so um, grounded and, 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 and generous in, sh in sharing the inner working of your mind, right? I, um, I really, what it really comes to from, from, for me is just how much you care about uh, and your family and, and how much you care about your, your wife, how much you care about your, your, your kids. And it really comes through and, and how that sh you allow that to, to shape who you are as a person, who you are as a man. It's a beautiful thing to, uh, to, to experience. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thank you. All right, my friend. Till next time. Bye-bye.